My text this morning is found in Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the supremacy of Jesus. You know, and today, uh, today's society, we're, we're seeing this decline, a rapid decline, I, I think, in, in the church in the Western world on, on many fronts right now. Um, I, I've been in communication with a number of pastors, friends of mine and, and people that I know that are pastors, and, and the church right now in North America, uh, with the exception of small pockets here and there, is, is really, really struggling. And, you know, they're seeing a decline. I, one pastor I spoke to, he's so discouraged. Uh, 80% of his congregation is vacant. They're gone. Um, another pastor, half of his congregation is gone. Um, there, we're just seeing this um, huge problem that's developing um, within the church in North America because of conflict, because of all kinds of different things that are taking place right now. And, um, you know, well, these influences that we're seeing lately um, have played their part in this. Uh, the decline has been coming for a while in, in a certain sense of the fact that God is trying to get our attention. He's trying to get our attention. I, I believe this. And the decline has largely come as I, I believe a, a people have been listening to a lot of uh, today's modern day philosophies um, there's been a spirituality that has become customized, I guess you could say, to fit one's lifestyle choices. And um, the truth of God's word, for, for a lot of folks, has become more relative than absolute. And it, it, it tends to be pick and choose how I feel, not on how it reads and how it was intended sometimes. And not saying that that's across the board. Uh, I'm just saying that there is a struggle with this in the church, in the Western world. We've had it so easy and so, uh, I guess, uh, materially prosperous and, and just everything going our way for so long that people have kind of become complacent in their walk with God, and their Christianity has become something that kind of fits their life. Not that they fit into God's plan, but that God, a piece of God is a piece of their life. You know what I'm saying? And this is a real problem out there. And God is shaking it up. He's shaking it up. He's shaking me to the very core. He's probably shaking you to the very core over the past uh, couple of years, right? Have we felt the shaking? Okay. The trials, the, the tribulations, the, the struggling of, of attitudes, the, all of this stuff. You see, God allows hardship to come our way to expose the roots of what is happening inside of us. And if it's just easygoing and smooth sailing all the time, we never see the roots, and we think we're doing well. But as the church in Laodicea, we see the church in Laodicea thought they were rich and thought that they were so stable and doing so well, but they weren't. And God counsels them to buy from him you know, gold refined in the fire. He put salve on their eyes to help them to see and, new, and a white robe over them to cover their shameful nakedness. This is the message of the last church, the last church that Jesus, uh, in the Revelation, that was, that was addressing uh, the type of church. See, we see this across North America as a whole. Okay? And the shaking has come, and people are falling out in different ways. Okay? Now this morning, I want you to know that it doesn't have to be something that's catastrophic to our faith, our walk with Christ, or the effectiveness of our church. As a matter of fact, it can be a catalyst that causes us to repent and come to the Lord with the things that he wants us to deal with 
and lay them before his feet. Our attitudes, our actions, our behaviors, our motivations for doing things. God wants to shake this down and put everything at his feet and say, Jesus, I don't have the strength to do what I need to do on my own. I need you because you are supreme over all creation. And it's all about you. It's not about me. It's not about my little world. It's about your world, Lord. And I need to submit to your will. This is what God is trying to do in our midst. How we respond to that is the question. Will we resist? Will we go the other way? Will we depend upon the philosophies and the basic principles of this of this world rather than on Christ? Or will we re repent in the areas where he's exposed and pulled back the curtains and allow the Holy Spirit to, to draw us closer to be the people that he wants us to be? You see, our state of intimacy with God does not have to be on the decline. Where there is a rapid decline, there, is, there too can be a hunger for spiritual truth and newness. We can allow the trials to lay us bare and then ask the Lord to fill us. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with your power. Fill us with your hunger. Help us to, to see where we need to go. Give us this day our daily bread. This is what Jesus said that we should pray. And whoever asks the Lord for his bread will be filled by the Spirit of God because God does not give us a stone in the place of bread. He will give us nutritious bread of life. We don't have to be in the decline. Now, the Apostle Paul, um, you know, he had a philosophy of this world that he was dealing with in his age. And you know what's the same spirit behind it all? The philosophy of this age, the, 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 the spiritual forces of this age are the same back then as they are today. And the same deception takes place back then as it is taking place today. And, and, and the, Paul understood the challenge that errant philosophy posed in the church of his day. And we need to understand the... the the same thing in our day, the same challenges in our day to understand the errant philosophy that so easily works its way into our lives. In the book of Colossians, Paul addresses the error of futile worldly thinking by reminding the church about the source of truth. Today I'm going to preach about Jesus because he is the key to everything that we need in this life. Everything, absolutely everything. The fullness of God is in Christ. So the supremacy of Christ, Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 23. He starts off, Paul says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. I'm just going to stop at that first verse. The first verse in our text says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And much false teaching has surrounded this verse over the centuries. At the beginning of the church age, people took this verse 15 out of context and got it wrong. One of the first people to promote a false doctrine on this verse, his name was Arius, who started a cult, an offshoot of Christianity, just some time after 325 AD. Now, Arius proclaimed that God is the one source of all things and that everything other than God came into being through an act of creation, which he called into existence. The Father God is uncreated and eternal, said Arius, but the Son of God is subservient to the Father. Therefore, the Son of God is not eternal, but created. Although he is not in the same category as other beings, being the firstborn among creation, nevertheless, he was not eternal in existence. These Arian teachings were based upon a complicated mixture of biblical references, including texts which seem to imply that Christ is inferior to the Father in essence, not just in position. Now this heresy has resurfaced, and we see it today in the modern Jehovah Witness movement. The Jehovah Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, but they think that Jesus is a created angelic being. They believe that Jesus 
It is actually Michael the Archangel. One of the scriptures that they used to support this position is found in 1 Thessalonians. And this scripture refers to the coming of Jesus to rapture his people out of the world, being preceded by the shout of the archangel. Thus, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So they take the scripture again out of context. Holding to the position out of context identifies, uh, it, it fails to identify the, the true purpose of ministering angels. But in proper understanding, this scripture does not say that Jesus Christ will be heralding his own arrival. He's not saying that. The coming of Jesus will accompany, be accompanied by the shout of an archangel whom God will handpick to participate him, with him in this occasion. The shout will be accompanied by a trumpet call to herald the arrival of the king. Jesus Christ being the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Throughout the Bible, we see the angelic beings often being placed by God into positions to be heralds and to accompany the arrival of very important events. We see this throughout the Bible. And the Jehovah Witness position um, is that Jesus Christ is not God, but Michael the archangel. And, uh, but this fails... To, to consider what is spoken of in Scripture in Hebrews. And, and, and the reason I'm talking to you guys about this is it's important that we understand the nature of Christ, the nature that Jesus Christ is not just a man, that he is not an angel that has come down, that he is God in the flesh and the mediator between God and man. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 10 says this, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I become your father? Or again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire, but of the son, he says, of the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be your sep the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. See, some people can't get their head around this because Jesus is called the Son of God. We're going to talk about that. Through the scriptures, Jesus repeatedly uh, said that he is doing the Father's will, therefore implying that he is subservient to the Father. The question then becomes, how can Jesus be equal to God when by his own admission he is subservient to the will of the Father God? Good question. This is where the Arians got it wrong. This is where the Jehovah Witnesses took it off in the wrong direction. The answer to this question lies within the nature of God being clothed in human flesh. Now, scriptures um, such as this, this one, suggesting that Jesus is the firstborn and the Father is greater than I, those quotes, right, have been taken out of context to imply that Jesus is inferior to the Father in his essence and is therefore a created being. However, when taken into consideration with the whole council of Scripture, from cover to cover, we see that that interpretation is faulty. When Paul spoke of Jesus Christ as being firstborn, and Jesus spoke of himself as being inferior to the Father, neither Paul nor Jesus himself were suggesting that the Son of God was inferior to God in essence. But they were speaking concerning Jesus being inferior in his position as a humbling following the Father's will. So in position, he follows a structure with the Father being the pinnacle. So he's submissive to the Father's will, but in essence, he is one with the Father. They are one God. So the human flesh Jesus had clothed himself with, in order to fill, fulfill the purposes of redemption, was weak. But more than this, Jesus chose to submit himself under the Father's authority. 
on purpose. It's a, it is a design for us to submit to our authorities as well, too, right? There's a whole lesson in that. Jesus acknowledges his position of submission to the Father in John 5.19. He says this. Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Even Jesus' disciples had a hard time grasping the truth of the concept of Christ's inferiority to the, to the Father in position, but equality with the Father God in essence of his person. They had a hard time with this, right? In John 14, 9, remember, Philip came up to Jesus and asked him to show him the Father, and that will be enough, you know? Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been in, among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus clarifies Philip's misunderstanding that he was inferior to the Father in his essence, Remember the time in scriptures where the Pharisees, where uh, they wanted to kill Jesus because, because Jesus made himself to be equal with God? Remember that? John 8, 48 to 58 speaks of it. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets did, and yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, they will never see death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is, it, is, is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He, was saw, it, he saw it, and he was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not 50 years yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Wow. Now, if you are not studied in Bible stories, this truth claim that Jesus made might not be some big deal, right? Maybe it's just not a big deal. You just really, well, what's the point, Pastor Clint? Well, the religious men knew this story about the history of the people of, of Israel when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, called him to take off his sandals for he was standing on holy ground. God appeared to him in the burning bush and called him to go to Egypt to set his people free. And Moses said, well, tell me, who should I say has sent me? God told Moses to tell them, I am has sent him has sent, sent you. I am. Tell them I am has sent you. I am. So the Jewish religious men were attacking Jesus' character. They knew when Jesus made his truth claim, saying that before Abraham was, I am, Jesus was claiming to be God because God is the great I am. He is the alpha, the beginning, the omega, the end, and everything in between. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God, the great I am. Jesus was saying, I am God. I am the great I am. You don't recognize me. You don't recognize my father. You don't recognize the mission that I have on the earth for you to, 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 to be the sacrificial lamb. God loves us so much that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, born in the flesh, as a sinless human being, as a sinless God-man. He was born into the world to show us what God is like with skin on and to pay the price that we could not pay. We owed a debt that we could not pay. And he paid the debt that we owed. This is the gospel. This is the good news. If you take the divinity of Christ out of it and make him some, some, a subservient person to the Father in essence, the whole thing falls apart. It is not the way God intended God 
is one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, but one in essence, one God. Three distinct ministries that they accomplish. But all one. So after Jesus said these words, the Jewish religious bureaucrats, they tried to kill him. Why? Because he was in, in fact claiming to be God. Our text in, first Col- in Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17 continuing, the apostle continues to speak of the superiority of Christ when he states this. He says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Pay attention to this. We're all disappointed in the election. Nobody wanted to see what happened happen in the election. We're all disappointed. Did you know God knew this before it ever happened? That it was going to be this way? And everything was created for him and by him to accomplish his purposes? Nothing taken him by surprise? God has allowed this to happen to accomplish a purpose that we have yet to see, but we will see it unfold. And I can tell you one, the purpose is for the church okay, to be refined and the church to be strengthened and the church to be a light in the darkness. As the darkness grows deeper out there, the light shines brighter provided that we do not put a bushel or a covering over our light. God calls us to shine our light before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. For in in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. It's not about me. It's not about my little world. It's about Jesus. It's about the Lord God Almighty who created things for his purposes. Because he wanted to have a relationship with the creation that he created because of his great love. He invites us into, into, his, into his presence. And he does it by his own blood. By making a way so that we can be cleansed and we can come into the presence of a holy God. What an incredible statement. Jesus, in Jesus Christ, all things were created. When he means all, everything He means all, everything on earth, visible that we see, and invisible behind the scenes. Don't you ever think that the enemy has control? He doesn't. God only allows the enemy to have the power that he has to serve his purposes. God could say it in a second, and the enemy is flat down, done. There is all power in the Lord God Almighty. So your circumstances, our country, no matter what we face, God is in complete control and he understands the beginning from the end. And he does not wish for us to carry that burden on our own shoulders. He wishes us to trust him and to do what is right, to shine our light, that they might see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Nothing was created by accident. Nothing. Sometimes as people we get sidelined by philosophical considerations and discussions and all this stuff which originate in the minds of men rather than in the mind of God. Paul warned about these things and he says in Colossians 2, 8 to 10, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive. And he's speaking to Christians, by the way. This is to the Colossian Christians and it applies to all of us. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends upon the human tradition and elemental principle, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. See, the fact that he's instructing us, see to it that you don't get taken captive means that there's a possibility that we can be taken captive. So we need to look at this and pray, God, help me not to be taken captive by erroneous philosophies that depend upon the principles of this world and the basic uh, spiritual elemental forces of this world rather than on Christ. Can Christians be influenced by demonic voices? Absolutely you can. Do they possess Christians? No, but they can can whisper in your ear and and, and tempt you and cause you to, to go astray 
and, you're, and, and cause you to have a bad attitude, bad actions, bad motives for doing things? Oh, that's a, because that renders you ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Christ and, and makes it so that the gospel is not effective in your community. That's the wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities and powers of darkness in high places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. You've been given everything you need. We don't have to decline. We don't have to decline. We don't have to backslide. We don't have to allow bitterness and anger and rage and malice to build in our hearts. We can let it go and let the Holy Spirit soften us and make us have a heart of flesh just like the heart of Christ. It's time that we take a stand. And how we take a stand is by saying, you are worthy. You are worthy. We stand by falling before the Lord. We stand by falling and worship before the Lord. That's how we take our stand. And as we wait upon the Lord, the strength will rise. God gives us the bread of life and he wants the hungry to be fed. Uh, Paul continues describing the position of the Lord Jesus in our text in verse 18. He says this, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. You see? Supremacy of Christ. He's supreme over creation. He's supreme over the circumstances. He's supreme over this pandemic that's, that's created so much trouble in our world. He's supreme over all things. And all things serve his purpose. Paul states that Jesus is the author of a new covenant between God and the people of the world, right? He is the head of this new order of things. The new order that he has established is his church. In other words, God himself gave uh, came up with this wonderful plan of salvation for people to be uh, saved, but also a wonderful organization for people to be a part of, of which he is a part of. And as a matter of fact, he's the brains of the whole thing. And everything is interconnected with him as the head. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. The creator of the universe is the designer of the church body. And many people say they don't, need to have to, they don't need to have to be a part of a church to serve God. That's erroneous. I'm sorry, that's, that's heresy. You have to be part of a church to be part of God because God's church is his design for his people. And you can't separate yourself from that. You are part of it. If you're a believer, you're a part of it. So you might as well work with the other members of that part, right? Of, of the body. Many people say they don't need to, to, to do this. They can have their own spiritual walk. But sadly, those who embrace that way of thinking, it leads to spiritual sterility and disillusionment and does not serve the purposes of God and the earth that he desires. He doesn't desire us to pull back into our own little colony. He wants us to be salt and light. Salt, wherewith it shall be salted. If it's not mixed in with the world and it's not salty, what's the purpose? You are the salt of the earth. You're to be mixed in with the decay, to act as a preservative. And it doesn't mean pulling back into a shell. It means letting your light shine, letting your salt of the spirit be sown into the decay, that they see you as a Christ-like one, not as someone who holds the philosophy of Christianity, but as a Christ-like one who lives, who breathes what he believes, who walks what he believes. And that means our attitudes, both in the person and online, are important. Our words that we speak, both in person and online, are important. Everything we do is a light or is a stumbling block out there. God says, shine your light that they may see your good works, emphasis on good, and glorify your Father in heaven. There will be people that are going to hate us for our stand for Christ. But if we're persecuted for unrighteousness' sake because our actions are unrighteous, that is not how God wants it to be. You can be persecuted by just being plain obnoxious. 
You want to be obnoxious? People are going to hate you. They're going to turn away from you and you're going to push away from you. You're going to say, if that's, what you, if that's the Jesus that you guys say that you have, I don't want anything to do with that. That is an affront to the, the work of Christ. My friend, you've listened to a demonic influence if you're approaching it that way. If the light that shines out through your words and your deeds is darkness, it's not accomplishing what God's designed to be. And don't be surprised if people say, I don't want anything to do with that. We are to be the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I'm, I'm speaking to myself too. Like everything you hear me speaking here, first and foremost, is here too. This is not something we ever come to fully grip on, right? You ever found you're doing real well and all of a sudden you get kicked on, on your keister? You fall on your keister and you go, how did that happen? How did I get here? God help me. Forgive me. See, there's a wrestling going on. Sometimes you get thrown to the mat. Right? But the righteous gets back up. He says, Lord, give me strength. Lord, forgive me. If I've erred in something, okay, God just wants me to give it to him and say, I give this to you, Lord. Paul continues in his dialogue. For God was pleased, in verse 19, to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What a powerful scripture. The salvation plan and what we live and what we are part of is pleasing to the Lord. You're his people. He loves you. He wants to encourage you today to stand up for, for him, not because you're earning your salvation. You can't earn anything. But because of the grace of God and the love of God, and he wants you to love him just as he loves you. He desires to birth within you, the desire to obey him because you love him, not because you're afraid of the big stick. God pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, to reconcile all things to himself. Aren't you glad, as a believer, that you're, you've been reconciled to God? There, you're, you have peace with God. This world doesn't know peace. You know Jesus. You know peace. The Prince of Peace is your Savior. The Prince of Peace is your God. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, make your requests known before God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Know God. Know peace. Submit to God and find peace in every storm that you encounter. It's not always going to be easy, but he's there. You're not always going to do it the right way, but he's there and his grace is there so that you can come to him and say, Lord, I just need an adjustment. <laughs> you know, every day we should actually pray that. Lord, today, I know that my heart is easily pulled astray. I just need you to adjust me today. Just put me in line with what you want. Put me in line with what your Holy Spirit desires today. I can't do this on my own. I can't make myself right. But would you please do that? Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon him and he will care, he, for he cares for you. See? This scripture. God loves us and he's promises that he's promised that he's going to meet all of our needs. You know, we weren't made... Uh, God was not made for us. We were made for him. When you're his child, he extends this grace and he's going to give you everything that you need 
and more. You see, that, that's what the loaves and fishes miracle represents on so many different levels. Right? He doesn't say he wants you to be out there and do all the work. He just wants you to bring what you have to him. It might be just a few measly little fish and a couple of loaves of bread. It's all you got. And there's a whole mass of people out there that are starving for truth. They're starving for life. They're starving to know what's real. And you, God just says, you feed them. And how are we going to feed these people? We can't feed them. I can't do this. I can't be the person that you want me to be. I can't be the witness. I can't explain everything and all mysteries and all that. Kind of, I can't do this, God. And he's like, just bring me what you have. And then he blesses it and he says, now pass it out. And guess what happens? Boom. The whole crowd is fed. And not just that, but there's leftovers. The fullness of leftovers. Not just a little bit but overflowing leftovers. See? In the long term, the Lord's great act of making a new creation in the saints will liberate the chaos caused by sin in the cosmos. I'm going to say that again because that's a, a mindful, okay? In the long term, the Lord's great act of making a new creation in his saints will liberate the chaos caused by sin in the cosmos. <laughs> Why? Because he chooses to work through his church. And he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. God's chosen to work through you, my friend. Not because he has to. Not because you got everything that you need to do the job by yourself. But because the little that he has, he wants to multiply it. And he wants to feed people that need spiritual food. And the Holy Spirit will take what you offer to him and will multiply it and will meet the need out there. Those whom Jesus has made righteous through the sacrifice he has given in the shedding of his own blood will be raised from the dead. <laughs> this is great news. And believers who are alive at the time of Christ's coming will be transformed. <laughs> in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be transformed. Jesus has made peace with us through his shed blood on the cross, whether in life or in death. Whether we die and we go to see him, or whether we're transformed. We see the rapture, and we're raptured up. You know, the blood of Christ is powerful. The blood of Christ is the reason why we live and move and have our being. And lots of people that don't know uh, Jesus, they, they get weirded out about the blood of Christ, right? Like, what's the blood? What, what are you talking about, the blood? The blood of Christ is, there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Christ's blood is shed so that we could have our blood not shed. <laughs> it's the substitutionary sacrifice. The blood of Christ, we don't, review, we don't regard that in a superstitious manner. It's not a magical potion, nor is it the literal blood of Christ. Okay? It's, it's, it's literally, uh, you see, see, there's only so many molecules in the blood of Christ that was shed. So, what it is, is its, it's, um, its purpose is symbolic. Um, the blood of Christ speaks to us of the real physical death of Christ in our place, on our behalf before God. That literal death in our place and literal judgment he bore on our behalf is what saves us, right? This is why, you know, you know communion, sometimes there's been some, some um, uh, mis misunderstanding where, some people say when you take communion, it actually turns into the literal blood and, and body of Christ miraculously, right? It's not superstitious like that. We take communion in memory of Christ. We're going to do communion next Sunday. But, you know, the reconciliation occurs, occurs through the blood of Christ. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Romans 10, 
Or Romans 3, 9 to 12 tells us, as it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. We're all in the same boot, right? We're all lost without the work of Christ, the blood of Christ, separated from him by our sins, alienated to him, from him, slavery, captive to slavery, to hollow and futile thinking that has been brought as a result of evil. We deserve God's wrath, but God's wrath has been, has been averted on his children. Instead of his wrath, God in his mercy looked on us with compassion and, and saw how unable we were to free ourselves. And in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 3, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is why God's grace is so amazing, right? Romans 6.10. Romans 5, 6, 10, sorry. It says, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This is the supremacy of Christ, the ability of our Savior to take darkness and shine his light upon the darkness and make darkness goes away, right? When the light shines on the darkness, it goes away. If your heart is dark and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can come to know him and he takes, he takes his spirit and puts his spirit within you. And God is pure light. And when the Holy Spirit moves inside of you, where does the darkness go? When you turn the light on in a room, the darkness disappears. Why? Because the light overtakes the darkness. Not the other way around. You can't take a measure of darkness and put it into the light. Right? The light shines in the darkness. The light dispels the darkness. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and you ask ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, he comes inside, the light comes inside of you and shines into your dark heart, illuminates it, and the darkness disappears. That's the miracle of the superiority of God's plan. You can be reconciled. You can come from darkness into light. You can be set free. You can live a life that is pleasing to him. God wants to take your life, and he wants to weave you into the fabric of his church. See, each of you are woven into the fabric of his church. He's woven this tapestry, and you're part of it. You might be a little thread over here, and I might be a little thread over here or whatever, but God's making this beautiful tapestry. And when it's completed, the church age is done. And the tapestry continues to be put together. Sometimes it takes years for us to grasp the full measure of what it means to be a Christ-like one, right? You know, our whole lifetime we're learning more and more. We need need to come to him daily because our, our flesh is weak. The spirit is strong, but our flesh is weak. But God's objective is to set us free, to set his children free. Freedom to live and to be used by God in a manner that he sees fit. When we, le- when we look at the work that he has accomplished, accomplished in us, it brings glory to him. Now, you are a testimony of reconciliation. God desires that we thank him for his work, that we repent when we get sidetracked, And then we allow the Holy Spirit to continue growing us and establishing us in the faith. And just to close, the last two verses of our text. But now, 
He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. See, Christ is supreme. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is God. God in the flesh. It's by his grace that we were provided reconciliation. And he's called us to be joined with him and with other believers in his tapestry to be a part of a wonderful plan to bring us all together collectively to true freedom. And that's going to happen on the other side. You are worthy. We're going to stand before the throne of God and we're going to throw ourselves down before him and say, you are worthy and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, God is so good. We can be individuals, yet, he's, yet he can speak to millions. He's so awesome, so big, yet so personal. Knows the number of hairs on your head. He cares about you and everything that you're going through. He's your creator, the sustainer of all things. Being aligned with human movements and ideologies only gives the illusion of freedom. But only reconciliation with God brings true freedom to people. This is the secret to living as it was intended to be lived, or life to be lived. This freedom brings joy in the Lord and hope for our eternity. Amen? Understanding the superiority of Christ over all creation is the secret that has been revealed to all who come to believe. Be encouraged today, my friends. Yeah, maybe you stumbled. Maybe you've fallen. Maybe you've done some crazy, silly things. Who hasn't, right? There is one who's an advocate on your behalf. The Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, steps in. And he says, I give you my grace. I give you my peace. My peace I leave you, not as the world leaves. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the Lord's message to his disciples before he ascended, right? I'm with you oh, to the end of the age. Are we at the end of the age? Well, we're somewhere there. We don't know exactly where we are on the timeline, but we're there. And he's with us, right? A plan, God, God has you as part of a plan to be part of this church here. To eat part of this tapestry, this part of the tapestry, we're a part of the tapestry somewhere on the, on the big picture. And you are part of that little part of the tapestry. And, and God, he wants you to understand he's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit in essence. The Father is in position the top dog. No, he's not the dog. Yeah, that's the wrong, wrong way to put it. He is the top in position, right? And his son is his, is his reconciler of humanity, who he calls, the, he is the son of God. Everlasting to everlasting, he created the universe through the son. God created the universe through the son. He also saved us all through the son. And the son is now seated at the right hand of the Father, ascended into heaven, and he's given us his spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing of what is to come in the future when we stand before the throne of God. And when we don't know the wild, awesome things that are in store for the believers, we don't know. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome when we get there. And you think... Now, I've had people say, oh, well, is it, it's just like you play a big harp up there all, you know, for eternity. Isn't that boring? Like, no! No, get, to, get that picture out of your head, okay? You know, you're going to be worshiping God, but the eye is not seen, nor is the ear, ear heard, nor is it entered into the mind of men, the things that God has in store for those that love him. 
God has an eternal life. Life to the very fullest for us as believers. Be encouraged today, no matter what you face. His desire is that we learn to share these principles with others and be encouraged to walk with our eyes on Jesus and on eternity and understanding that everything that we, we have has been given to us um, has been given to us for our purpose. And that means even our trials. We'll get into that a little bit more next week.